All right, welcome back to another episode of Cameo with Nevin Webster. I'm actually uh, recording it for the first time ever at a Tim Hortons, which, if uh, you're not from Canada, is kind of our flagship <laughs> restaurant. But uh, I'm not a big Timmy's person, uh, personally. Ever since McDonald's basically stole uh, Timmy's coffee, I've been, if I want fast food coffee, you know, McDonald's my my go-to. But this uh, this location was requested by my next guest, who actually has been one of my most... Uh, I know he, he's been a cheerleader in a way. Like he's, he's shown more love to the podcast. I rock the pom poms. He rocks the pom poms. He, uh, he, he's shown more, uh, you know, support uh, from behind the scenes than than most people. It is none other than Slum Glutton. Hey, what's going on, y'all? So Slum Glutton, just to fill y'all in, in is a local rapper here in Kamloops. Uh, we met each other at a Hazmat show. Um, Hazmat is a rap group, and. Uh, he was there. I'm pretty sure he was doing some freestyling or just messing around. Just I was, um, I was doing. Um, you didn't. It wasn't my show. I performed though. I was um, on uh, Revise's set. Yes, Revise had a set, and me and him had some collabs. And uh, Revise is another rapper. FYI, he's another rapper. Yeah, and Lila Peterson, she's a singer. And yeah, we all we had some collabs. And um, Curtis Beeman, uh, Squirrel Entertainment, he had called me up and said, "Yo, I got a this show, and it's a it's a comedy, a comedy uh, a show. Do you have any funny any funny songs?" And I said. Um, no, not really. All my stuff's kind of deep and grimy and, you know, and, and, and he's like, well, do you want it or not? And I was like, you know what? I got a couple other shows. And I was like, oh, I was like, no, I'm good. I'm, uh, I, I don't want to come there and ruin the vibe. Maybe I'll come check it out and support, right? Um, a week before, Revise called me up and said, do you want to come and do a, a, our song? And our song is like super deep. And I'm like, I thought that was a comedy show. And he's like, well, I got one funny song. So I took it. So it was funny because in all reality, I probably should have just did a set there anyway. That was a funny show. It was it, at, uh, I was at the Sand Bar and Grill, if you guys are familiar. No, no, it was at the, it was at Anavets, it was, Army okay. and Navy. Bar. Yeah, it was at the other side. Other side, Of yeah. the Sand Bar. So yeah. it, it, it was an odd show. It was a great show, though. It was actually fun. It was intimate and fun and just, it was a good vibe. Funny story about that show is um, I showed up and I'm like sitting there by myself. I'm always there first and I'm like, I see there's a one karaoke speaker in the corner. And just as a joke, I messaged, uh, I messaged Curtis and I said, dude. Uh, Curtis is the promoter in this case, just so you guys know. And he's got another show coming up with Hazmat again very soon. And I am doing a full set there, so make sure you come check that out. That's at the Rock and Firkin, I believe. Yeah. And I, I messaged Curtis as a joke. I said, dude, this, this stereo system here is banging. And he's like, oh, really? I was like, are you being serious or are you joking? I said, um, I'm joking, bro. And I sent him a picture of this single karaoke speaker. And he shows up, and he's super upset. And, I was, and, he's, like, and he's like, dude, the, the, the DJ backed out. The DJ had all the sound equipment. And he's like, I don't have anything. I'm like, are you kidding me? So we go in there, and uh, yeah, just the karaoke speakers. So he's freaking out. Everyone's freaking out. I'm like, these hazmat guys are on tour. I never met them yet. They show up. It was it was pretty funny because um, so somehow, some way, some guy. I wish I remembered his name to give him a shout out. He showed up with a subwoofer. So we had a big subwoofer. This guy who owned a studio brought it. He was our sound guy, which he just got roped into it. We all bought him beer to do it, and. Um, these two karaoke speakers because they actually had the other one and and then we had seven uh, cordless mics with no idea how to use them the studio guy couldn't use them so we spent about an hour trying to hype the crowd up just through our voice and it, it, it was yeah. the epitome of what would be a local rap show oh yeah like just like <laughs> odd places odd people yeah. sound guy not coming through typical but, but you've been at just about every rap show in town, you're a big, big supporter of it. But let's let, let's dial it back because obviously, you know, both of us know a lot more about you know the BC underground rap mm-hmm. scene than than the average person, and a lot of people might not know who you are. Let's start off with your name, Slum Glutton, which obviously you're a bigger guy, hence Glutton, I imagine. Oh, you want to know the origins behind yeah, let's, Slum Glutton? Let, let's start with Slum Glutton. Oh, all right, okay. So <laughs> I was wondering if you're going to ask me. Oh, you have so, to. So um it's, it's not a normal this name. This is actually pretty cool. So um so I was going to co- I was trying to come up with a rap name. First, my first rap name when I was younger, when I I, I wasn't really a rapper, was Big C. 
And my middle name is the letter C, but uh, that's another story. But um, So I was kind of come up with a rap name. And when I was a kid, I used to go to the kitchen and I'd take out all the like the leftovers and I'd take a bunch of other stuff and I'd chop it all up and I'd just put this big like shit mix of stuff in the in the frying pan and mix it all up and you know like and my mom's like you know what you know that's your 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 grandpa used to love doing that it's called slum gullion and back in the day, uh, they used to serve slum gullion. My mom's a waitress, bartender. She used to, they used to just basically, it's like a, sh- it's basically like a stir fry or a stew of the chef salad version. Pretty okay. much the table scraps all mixed together. Is it like a Great Depression era sort of thing? Yeah, it's like a goulash, but, uh, but not that, that, uh, that uh, part of the world. Um, so I was like, slum gullion could be my name. And I started looking into it. So slum gullion um, actually started... Um, I think it was Moby Dick. It was actually it was actually written. Uh, it was actually created in a, in a, in a fictional story, um, and then they called it Slob Goulian. Hmm. And it was like uh, basically, if you ever watched Trailer Park Boys, they drink swish. So it started out as a, a washy liquid that was like basically ma- made just like like moonshine. Uh, yeah, but not even moonshine. Like 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 a barrel like barrel like barrel beer or something and then that turned into slum gullion which was basically just a sh- basically table scraps which is kind of like a goulash you know and um i like the so i was like i'm gonna use that slum gullion but i was like i don't know it's like something about it i was like it needs something else to it and um and i was at the time i was just kind of just starting to write, actually write and take things serious and um I was looking at this producer. His name's Clive Craven. I don't know if you ever heard of him. No. I've never heard of him again. He's must be big where he comes from. But um, and he took his his name from what his favorite his favorite serial killer and his favorite um, um, horror um, um, director, Clive Craven. And I was like, oh. And then I was like thinking, and I was like, slum. And I was like, I was like, what's my favorite sin? It's gluttony, because I've been a glutton my whole life. It just means eating to excess. You're, you're a big dude. Yeah, I'm a big dude. And, yeah, but it's like the obsession of it, too, right? Like, I, I struggle with that. Like, I, I start eating, I can't stop. And I, I eat to the point where it's a waste. And um, gluttony also, and if you look back into um, um, into other times, it also meant just to eat. Back in the day, it was a sin to eat um, really nice food, if it was really extravagant. And I was always, I loved to cook. If I wasn't, if I wasn't, if I, you know, if I would have stayed in school, I would have been, I've been a chef or something. So it's funny because you take Slum Gullion, which is this mix of all this stuff and you put it together. And that's kind of like my, my music is it's kind of like a mix of all this shit. And then it, and you know, and it's just like, you just cram it down your throat until you can't eat no more. Right. Which is, which is nice that you kind of like say it's a mix of stuff. Cause like hip hop is in my opinion, one of the only f- free genres 100%. to experiment. Yeah. Right, because we we were talking at uh, the last show we were at together at CJ's, the Rap Loop show, about how you were playing with country and bringing that in to yeah. to your hip hop. More, more blues, but yeah, yeah. Blues, okay, yeah, yeah. But you had the 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 guitar as basically yeah. your beat, yeah, and and just really just messing around and, and having some freedom. So so slum. That doesn't refer to like kind of your upbringing or where you came from. It, it, it's, it's purely kind of this. Well, I grew up. I grew up fairly poor. Um, I, I didn't meet my dad till I was eleven, and me and my mom, single mom. I grew up. I lived in Nelson. We lived in, you know, we were like mom, single mom. Sometimes we were on welfare, so I, I never really, never went without. But I always never had uh, what, what most people had. Like it was always just the bare minimum. Um, you got by. We got by. Um, and, but I remember when I first threw on, like, I remember first starting listening to hip hop and like Wu Tang Clan. They're talking about and like, and like uh, Master P and stuff. And it's like, you know, they're talking about being poor and living in in, in the projects. And I remember living in this like, in like this apartment where it was in the poor side of town. And I remember, and my, I didn't, I I didn't know my dad. I, I never met him. I actually thought he was. I, I actually thought my dad was dead. So and all these guys from the ghetto and the states are talking about, you know, my dad's gone. I'm poor. I'm on welfare. Mo- single mom. And that's what drew me to to hip hop. But the name Slum Gullion came from 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 the food. Slum Glutton came from the food, which is pretty slummy it's from the slums that's why it's called that totally. um but later on in my life i got really heavily into addiction and i you know and, and yeah and uh, anyone that knows me when i started making music a lot of people are like slum glutton i don't get it but if you knew me personally be like that name suits him 100 percent. and yeah. and they don't know the story behind the 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 food and the slum gullion but they just know me that slum glutton that's riley you know yeah yeah. yeah, like wh- when I learned about your rap name and I looked at you, like it made sense. Like, y- like you didn't need an explanation per se. Yeah. 
Like, you're, you, you're just like, okay, that's, that's yeah. fact. <clears throat> and it, it sounds nice, too. I'll yeah. be honest. Some people always call it some gotten, gotten, they can't get it. But I noticed if you read it when it's spelt, you get it. If you just say it, some people, like, can't really get it. Slum gotten, and they, I'm like, slum glutton, because it's like the two L's. But it is what it is, man. It is who I am. I've, I, I kind of just, it just came into, my, came into who I am. And, you know, yeah. that's who people know me, right? So you're how many months sober now? Um, actually, I just had a relapse not too long ago, actually. I'm sorry to hear that, man. Yeah, it is what it is. Sometimes it's a part of the process. I had, uh, I had two years. I was coming up to my two years um, in sobriety, and uh, yeah, I just started started putting things about for my recovery. Um, I'm pretty serious about my recovery. Uh, some people are heavy drinkers and heavy users, and they yeah. live that lifestyle, and they grow and you know get married, have a kid, and and they stop. Some people. But some people, in my opinion, have the disease where you can't stop on your own. When you lose the control, when you lose, when you don't have the power to stop on your own, that's me. Like it's um, so for me, I have to. My life has to recovery has to come first. Yeah. And are you going to meetings? Is that kind of part of your recovery? Yeah, and I don't really get into that because that's there's anonymity behind that. Of but course. Yeah. But I'm in. Uh, yeah, I'm in recovery, and I do daily recovery stuff. I, I get in the middle of it because, for me, I'm such a sick motherfucker. I got to stay in the middle. That has to be my life. Otherwise, I'm going to go back to the way I was living, you know, and, and that's and that's and it's, di- some, it's different for some people. And um, yeah, and I wasn't uh, I wasn't doing the things that were keeping me sober and some things happened. And here you go. And I and I just ended up picking up, man. And, um, you know, thank God I, I, I got back pretty much. Uh, I was out for two months. Um, I never stopped being in recovery, though. I kept I kept. You, you know, kept pursuing, you kept, like, it kept was still pursuing. the goal. I stayed in, yeah. I had a couple bad nights. Um, actually, at the last, my last show, it was funny because a lot of my music's about recovery, and I went to my show um, at um, the, the Sandbar, and um, I did my show sober, but after I went, I went and got loaded at the bar, and I remember sitting there thinking, fuck, I wonder how many of these people actually listen to my music and know I'm sober and no one's noticing that I'm sitting here getting drunk and I went and vomited in the alley and I was, uh, it, was, it was a pretty embarrassing moment. After that, I was like, okay, hey, this isn't uh, good for anybody. And um, it, well. It's hard to explain to people what that draw is like and yeah. when you can't say no, like yeah. you know it's the wrong path, but you know you're not going to stop yourself. Well, it's easy. I, it's a mental obsession. Totally. It, it, it overtakes you. You just, like, know, like, if I can do this, at least then I can process the thought of trying again to get clean. Yeah. Which, you know, for me, it's just alcohol, and I'm, you know, a little over a week of, of no THC, which for some people is like, oh, that's not a drug. But, like, oh, yeah, you is. know, when when it uh, when you have to wake up at 6 a.m. to smoke weed before your baby wakes up yeah. just so you can function, you know, that's, that's not normal. Oh, yeah. It's funny that you bring that up because um, – I like it without getting into details. Um, um, I believe anyway, and we won't have to get into it, but I believe that uh, th- there's a physical allergy to, to alcohol and drugs. Some people, uh, and some people don't have it with the weed. But for me, when I put weed or blow or alcohol, something abnormal happens to me, and I have a phenomenon of cravings. I have to have more right now, and yeah. ain't nobody going to get in the way of it. And, 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 and some people get sober, and they can smoke pot. Well, guess what? When I wake up in the morning, like you said, at 5 in the morning, and that's most of my, most of my relapse this time was marijuana. I, I, but for me, I took one puff, and it was 24 hours a day, getting up in the middle of the night to take a puff so I could go back yeah. to bed. Um, I, I, re- I relate to that. Yeah. 100%. And, 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 and for me, it, it led directly to other things. And, you know, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I didn't really, I went out a couple of times. I got drunk once at that show. And then I got into some other things. And then I was like, okay, I'm done. I can't, I can't go back to where I was. Yeah. But, yeah, I it's, can relate to that. It's, 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 I struggle a lot to explain to people, like, well, well, when, when, when they see it from the outside in, mm. right, and it's like, guys, like, I don't care what you think of me or, or, or the Nevin you used to know or, mm. or anything at all, right? Like, throw that out the window. I'm telling you, it's, there, there, there's a certain clock, and it just ticks, and it's just like, okay, yeah. there, there's, there's nothing that you can do. No. It's going to happen. Well, because people, 
people don't understand that because people live on self-will. And self-will is if you don't like something, change it. And it's like I can tell you about a million, billion times where I'm sitting there broke to spend my rent money, you know, and, and, and it, all I could think about is getting more and, 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 and you don't think I wanted to quit, you know? Yeah. When you're dying, I'm seeing, watching my friends die. I'm waking up, my face is black and blue because I wasn't breathing while I was sleeping because I took too much, you know? Sitting, like, literally watching people die from it, you know, and, uh, my whole life and people are like, well, why can't you just stop? <laughs> well, yeah. don't you think I tried that? <laughs> yeah, it's... It's it's challenging. Like and and, and we're, we're on a street that obviously is notorious in Kamloops. Yeah, to, that's why I picked this place. To you know, I don't know how many dealers I'm going to see you know at the window right now as as we talk, right? And it's 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 just part of the reality. Mm-hmm. But uh, I don't know it's it's hard for people to level, like you know, just like to no. level with someone and go like I understand and empathize, but you know. It, you can you don't have to condemn someone, but you don't no. have to condone them either. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't, uh, we we get. You know what it is? Is we fear what we can't understand, and that's what it is. You know, and people are like, "Oh, I don't fear stuff. I'm a big old strong man. I don't get scared." But you know, yeah, we fear what we don't understand, and that's and that's what it is. And and it's, and imagine it's just like telling someone that, that you know that that's that they they don't have control over themselves. They they don't understand that because they do right. Yeah. Is there, is there mantras that you like go through your head to like like when you know something's happening that you like 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 is there like a verse of a rap that you just start like rapping yourself when you know something's coming up because like I I use um, colors or or pictures images concepts to like remind myself repeatedly of things to just like hey I need to start this now or I'm gonna end up down this road. Um. I, I pray and I meditate and I stay. In. So I believe in higher, a power greater than myself. Uh, some people call it God. I refer to it as God, uh, the gift of desperation, whatever you want to call it. The universe, whatever. The universe. It could be. You know what it is? Is it has to be, whatever it has to be. It can't. It has to be more powerful than you. You have to submit if, to it. If somehow. I can't, if I can't, if I can't believe that somewhere in the universe or somewhere in the world that there's a power greater than me, then I must be it. And trust me, I ain't God. And you know, and and I and I respect people who don't believe in that, and that's great. Um, but for me, I know that there is something out there personal to me that when I get on my knees or when I when I ask for help, like. And I get it, yeah. and I, you know, and, and 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 that's what I do. I just I just ask for help, and I at the end of the day, I thank I thank whatever it is out there for for what I have because I have a hell of a lot more than what other people have, and 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 it's it's about living in gratitude, right? Totally. And that's you, you said earlier that like there, there was a time when you started taking your music seriously. Where did, where did that fall in your like recovery, oh, and or how did it play oh. a role? Well, so when I was young, I always wrote poems and stuff, and I love rap. But I used to sit there and I'd pretend like I'd be a rapper, and I, and even I'll even really even back further when I didn't listen to rap, I would I would uh, I would do like dance choreography stuff, and like I always wanted to be an entertainer, right? Um, I did the men in, I did a Men in Black lip sync for my uh, for my grade four talent show. Like I was always into that, and I started writing into poetry when I was young, and. Um, and then later, um, I don't know what it was. I had a, a guy that came and lived with me. He was uh, my buddy Anthony, Anthony Millwater. He got he was a foster home, and he's like he was fighting with his foster family. So I let him stay on my, my me and my mom's couch. And me and him used to write raps, and we'd rap back and forth. And I would write my raps down, and I'd write them and stuff. And then then and then like his brother um, was like um, was like yo. Um, I'm doing this big thing at Bogart's Joints. This is Maple Ridge back in the day. There used to be this place that sold pipes, and it was called Bogart's Joints. It'd be a little cafe, and like, there's going to be this big rap battle. Well, I didn't know what battling was back then. I had no idea. And they're like, you're dope, man. You're dope. We're going to sign you up. And I was like, okay. So I went and memorized all these raps, all these beats, and I remember I remember walking up there. I'm like 15 years old, going to Bogart's Joint for this rap battle, and I had my, my, my CD with the beats on it that I wrote to, and then they're like, no, this is a battle that you like you don't do writtens and if you do you don't do them to the beat that you picked out right so i'm up there nervous as hell and i rap against this guy and i bombed i was so bad and i don't know how it worked out i didn't win but for some reason on the board they charted out that i i 
I was supposed to battle another person that didn't show up. So I guess I had two battles and I lost the one and the other one, the guy didn't show up. So I got on to the next round. And the next round was on another date at another venue. And I was like, oh my God. I was like, I, was, I never want to do that again. And my homie was just like, no, man, you got to go do it again. Just, just, just got to freestyle this time and like, don't go. And I'm like, I had no idea the difference. I, I still couldn't freestyle. You go you know, freestyle me. Like, I, I can't say shit without I write, I write songs. And I go up to this place, and for any of you guys know Hammy, Hammy, uh, the Northern Mike. He was, um, he's from Vancouver, he's dope. He used to, I think, I think he used to be in Keep Six, and like a lot of cats know him. He, he was in the rap game for a long time. Um, it still is, still is in the rap game. Um, um, he's, uh, he's a good cat. I remember, but back then, around those parts, he was the shit, man. Like, I was like, I, I had to rap this cat. And I was like, no way. I gotta go up here and rap like the best rapper in Maple Ridge, like in, 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 my, in, my, in my eyes. Like, I didn't know anybody else that rapped. Was this like late 90s then? <sighs> Early was, 2000s? This was, I'm, I'm, I'm 31 now, and this was when I was 15. So this was 16 years ago. Okay. Early 2000s, um, yeah. And I remember we went out there and and like and he was like trying not to diss me because we were homies. But he's like, so he's kind of like rapping the crowd. And I was just blank. Like I got slaughtered. I left there, and I'm like, I'm never rapping again, <laughs> ever again. <laughs> and, and I never did for the longest time. I I stopped there and there because I was like, I didn't know. I was like. Some cats are battlers, man. You go up there, dude. These cats are crazy, man. They fucking they fuck shit up. I would if someone challenged me, I'd step in the ring just so I didn't get punked. But I would not go looking for a battle rap. Yeah, like battle rappers are a different beast, a and cold. and it, they have their own niche and, and they kind of play by their own rules and yeah. they have their own community. And it's kind of a shame how the battle raps kind of died in the way that it has a little bit. But yeah. it had a heyday at one point. Mm. What uh, I was. Uh, I'll get back to my original question if I don't mind. Oh, that oh absolutely, for sure. I, tw- I was twenty, I was like twenty, and I, my dad lived out. We lived out two forty fourth, and we had this big uh, property, and um, I was using I was using a lot of drugs and uh, isolating a lot, and I started writing raps. I was like really into writing raps, and I didn't want anybody to know. And I used to like it was back when I was like super into like necro and like and like and, like like heavy like dark stuff. And I was like, and I'd always write these raps, and I was always rapping about what I was doing because all I was doing was using drugs. So all my rhymes were about doing drugs, and like and and I rap about the stuff I did because you know like because that's all I knew, and I didn't want to be like this guy rapping about all the stuff I didn't do. So my raps were really grimy because it was about being broke and and like and like hanging out on the street, and like because like you know when I was high as fuck, all my homies didn't want to hang out with me. I'd go hang out with all the, the weirdos on the street because at least they could understand, right? Yeah. And so um and my best friend, uh, rest in peace, Kyle Ripple. He was my best friend in the world, man. Never had a closer friend. He, uh, I showed him, and he was like, "Dude, this is this is, this is it, man. This this is so dope." I'm like, "No, it's not." And he like, he kept putting it on me and other people and like other friends. Like, Riley can rap. Riley, I'm like, "No, I can't." And uh, I ended up rapping for my one buddy, and he's like, "All my friends in Burnaby rap." And that's if you ever know Job's Witness, and like. Um, uh, DJ T Hayes and they had uh, it was North Burnaby like right on the border of like East Van and they had this place called the Compound and they, in the bedroom they had a closet with like foamies like and they and and then they kicked it hard and I went in there and I rapped uh, over like a, I think it was a DMX beat and there was like ten of these kids I never met before I was so nervous and I'm in this like I'm a big motherfucker and I'm in this little closet rapping for the very first time on a microphone and I oh man. And I got out, and all these kids were like, oh, man, that was crazy. I'd do it again. And so I ended up just, like, I used to take the bus from, like, East Maple Ridge, like, 244th to North Burnaby, which was, like, three connections and, like, like an hour and a half. And I'd go, I'd go hang out there, and I recorded my first mixtape. Awesome. But, yeah. Let's go back to, like, your, your school days or whatever it be. How were you in English class? Like, I was terrible in everything. I was, like, I suffered from attention deficit disorder. English was probably my best, but I got C's. Um, I, I, I can't print or write or draw. Like, you, 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 like it's like hieroglyphics, right? Like, um, my first five rap books, like, I, I, after I filled up five notebooks, and then I started... Um, 
I started typing them out because even I couldn't read my own shit. It was terrible in school. Um, no, no child left behind? Bullshit. I, I, I failed every class up into grade 7. They put me in high school, and then grade 8, I just got smoked. They're like, you don't know shit. Like, I couldn't even do normal math. Oh, really? Yeah, because they just keep passing you, right? But uh, totally. English class was I, probably my best. I, I'm fascinated with, with, with rappers, you know, because... It wasn't cool to write poems when I was in like school, no. or if, or if you did write poems, you, you damn well didn't show no one. Yeah, you know what I mean. So, I I think it's fascinating how like all of a sudden like, yeah, you don't write poems, but you hear all these like gangbangers like, oh yeah, I wrote poems. It's like, oh, yeah. I, it's like that doesn't line up with my 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 experience in in English Funny class thing. at all. I used to. I remember I was in grade five and in Maple Ridge and. Uh, Fuck. I was listening to DMX, It's Dark and Hell is Hot, and he's got, like, this poem about God, and I was listening to this, like, Mystical, has got a song about, um, on, like, one, on, like, Ghetto Fabulous, it's about, like, being on fire and the house on fire, and I, and I took all that and I wrote my own poem, and, like, like, I don't think I, like, copied any of their shit, but I remember it was just, like, this really dark, like, demon hellfire poem, and I just, like, I just wrote it, and it was, like... I remember only one line from it was like something about the blood spilt chapter. And I'm like, and I just, I don't know. It was dark and it was like, I don't even know where the hell it came from. And I read it out in front of my class and they actually called my parents, my mom, and was like, your kid, like. Your kid has some issues. Your kid's got some issues, but we think he's really good. Like he wrote a really good poem, but they're like, it's, it's really, I think you should read it. And my mom was like, yeah, I read it. It was dope. Shit. Like, hey. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, man, I was like, it, I was like, that's like what I came up off of, man. I remember just like, like how I felt, right? It was like, yeah, twenty nineteen is a totally different era than when we grew up, where where free expression, yeah. you know, kids want to be as unique and individualistic as possible. And, and it's cool it, what they're doing. Though. It's it's cool. It's crazy. Like I, I some remember of it. some <laughs> of it. Yeah, totally. Like I, I remember seeing this like young kid going up to like Lil Windex at the All Ages show. In February at uh, at the Italian club, what was that place called? Columbo Lodge, yeah. and this kid's wearing like it's a dude wearing what is like a silk bathrobe on like a Friday night to a rap show, and just going like, "Yeah, man, I write poems." And I'm just like, "Man, these kids are so free." Yeah. Like yeah. we didn't get this. Like like y- y- you were labeled the weird kid, but now like it's yeah. crazy how rap has like evolved into like this like new genre of like taking pieces from emo kids and punk and like yeah, man. and the outrageousness of hip hop now is mind blowing. Well you know what the cool thing is about it and like I I I didn't know a lot about the history and I remember I was living in Vernon and I was just doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, but I wasn't working. And I had a lot of time on my hands. And someone hooked me up with some KRS-One um, lectures. And I remember for months I just watched lectures that KRS-One did about hip-hop. And I didn't know any of this stuff. And it, I, it was before I did shows, but I, I had recorded a lot. And I had, I had released a mixtape, but I hadn't done any shows. So I was just kind of dipping my feet into the actual culture. And, you know, and he talks about the elements of hip-hop. And it's like... Um, you know, it's like uh, MCing, DJing, um, breakdancing, street fashion, street language. And now the way that the life is, like all these kids, like you said, emo kids and punk rock kids and all these people on the streets, you know, and like, you know, and if you if you listen to like, I think it's like the one of Karis once he talks about how like skateboarding and BMX writing, but it is all hip hop. And like, and now you see these, like, you know, all these kids and, and it's because these kids, like they come from a place where no one gets them yeah. and they want to be themselves. And they want to wear the clothes that they wear and they want to speak the language that they speak. And that's what hip hop, that's what it started with. Right. Hip hop is just the language of the streets. In whatever expression you want to express it in, yeah, and that's and yeah, and that started started where it started, but now that's what that's why we're getting all this stuff now, and it's cool, man. And I might not like all of it or like the, you know, like I do a song now, and it's like I almost don't even like doing it anymore, but I do because it's it's a good song. It's really how I felt. It's called uh, Hard Raps, and it was when when I started noticing everything changing, 
And um, now that I'm getting involved in the community and I'm like hanging out with guys like I like like I support the Lost Boys because I love those guys. Like they're out the Lost Boys. They're doing the their Lost own Boy. thing. They're, I they're, love. They're totally original own thing. Uh, they don't give a fuck what they think. They're 100%. just gonna have fun. I went to this. They I did some a couple songs in their studio and I went there and I was like, these kids are dope. And like and. Um, and that's the cool thing about nowadays is they're doing their own thing. They don't have to worry about what's cool. Like, we probably didn't either, but I remember I had to be, when I was out there, I wanted to be cool and hard and, like, and like be, be tough and dug dough. Like, because, like, you know, and it was, like, that's not what it is at all. It's about having fun. I was talking to another shout-out to Quote. We were talking about Quote. Cody the Captain, he's been on the podcast before. He is an OG yeah. of the Camus hip-hop scene. Shout he out was quote. talking about, like, how free these kids are and shit, you know, and like how, it, or no, even though that was you, but he was talking about the energy, like the good vibes. Like when we go to shows, like we, I'd go there and I'd keep an eye on my back. Like, cause oh, it was totally. like, and not like, not like the people aren't that hard, but it was like everyone, it was that vibe. Like we're here, we're hard. No one was dancing or having a good time. Like we seen cats the other day. They were from like Norway, wherever the hell they were from. Uh, they were the, exchange students and know, they just, <laughs> They, I don't think I've seen someone dance so freely, not giving oh, a fuck. Then these no exchanges, one cared, and they're like, and, and and I was like, yeah, dude, I, I was getting into it because it basically the new gen is like the is like the hippie generation of hip hop, like not in a bad way, but like in they're the free love and like, totally. and, and, and it's rad, right? And like Playboy Cardi and Lil yeah, Uzi Vert, yeah. all these guys have given them you know creative license to just like yeah. go out there and just do it because like they get told so much how to be and how to be this yeah. is the new rebellion yeah and the funny thing was is you bring up those guys like i hate those guys' music but all the people they birthed i'm getting into now like i got like all this like i'm j- i just started like i was listening I, like i like six months ago actually when i was on my relapse i was out for two months and i downloaded drake for the first time and like and like like uh, like um like all these like maybe they're not like new wave but like like um logic like i never listened to any of that stuff like i listened to no new music and i went on to like what was trending on spotify and i'm like hey i'll listen to this and this and this and i'm like and i was like listening to all these new songs for the first time and i'm like sitting on the beach i was off work life sucked but i was like and i was like bumping some lost boys and like great baker and like you know now i'm bumping like kairos and shit and i'm just like i get it i get it because i like I'm not that person no more where I thought I was like had to be all hard and tough and like yeah. and like I can I can be free now because I'm not trying to impress nobody and that's what that's where they're coming from and it's it's new to me to feel that way but it's it's a trip man it's a trip seeing these cats out there man. Oh it it's it, it boggles my mind yeah. like how how I was considered like kind of an outcast as like low key emo kid and you know <coughs> grade 9 grade 10 yeah. right and 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 it, for my outside in thing, it just it just seems like there's just this massive blog of blob of acceptance in, yeah. in the high schools. It, of course, there's going to be you know yeah. hatred amongst of certain course. people that, that doesn't go away. But it's yeah. just like I don't know. It's just it's just a whole whole another time. It, it gives me a lot. Of, it, it honestly gives me a lot of uh, optimism for the future. Mm-hmm. You know how how hip hop and, and street culture has has evolved yeah. into this like creative expression uh that yeah you had to be hard well or you had to like me like i've always been like the gentle giant but from where i come from and and, like and the people i surrounded myself with like it's funny because the people i surrounded myself with were hard and they didn't expect me to be hard but i thought i had to be to fit in no i get that you know like and the, the real people that are really like you get cats that are think they're hard and act hard but the people that are really hard they are hard because that's the fucking way they were raised and they had to be that way to survive yeah you know and like i had to you know i had to survive some pretty harsh stuff too but mostly like substance abuse and stuff like that but like people out there you know that they, they you, have, you knew the real ones in high school and you know the real ones now and, yeah. and, and you know they're so, real for but a reason i had to put that front on you know a lot of you won't catch a lot of cats saying that, but I had to put that front on because because I thought I had to, right? And you know, and, and and now I know that I don't have to. I can be myself. I can be who I am, and and I, I and I'm seeing that expressive change in my music too, right? But it's still, but my, all my perspective comes from from well, the, yeah. From it's, that. It, it's not going to change because so you, you still have that old school BC grime. Yeah, you know that doesn't go away. Yeah. Because, you know, I'm sorry, you're you're a white boy in B.C. You're never going to escape the B.C. grime. No, no. But then you look at the Lost Boys, right? Like, it's yeah. clear that 
their upbringing is going to be very different than yours, <laughs> right? Because oh, yeah. they're they're Sahali kids. If, uh, oh, if, if who if, knows? But you know, you don't know what the, those guys grew up with, right? The, oh, the of rich neighbor, the, the the better class neighbors, parents that make more money, they go through the same shit, right? Totally. But it's the it's the with the visuals that you see, right? Like, you know, and it's crazy because I I before I before I started getting into the new wave music and like and like and like seeing like like number one like like guys like Gray Baker and the Lost Boys and like Cairo all these people they're hustler grinders like hard work like I've always been lazy with my shit and these guys are out there like like they are doing it man they're yeah. living it and and so it's like and and I wrote this track and it's it's like not to be disrespectful to anyone but it's my like it was my reaction to actually noticing that hip hop changed and it was like it's the clothes, and then I realized when I went back to analyze it, it was what it was. Is because hip hop is like it's a, it's street language, it's street fashion, right? That's what a big part of it was, and it's changed so much, and it's so much different from that. So that's why I have a react to it. And the dance, like we were talking about the trap arms, the trap arms, yeah. you know, you know, like if you if you Facebook the the gift bar and you put Kamloops, you'll see the slum glutton trap arms, but like, and then you got the skinny jeans, and it's like and everything is so much different. So it it ups sets you because that's like that's not my shit but that's what we have to remember is that it isn't it's about it's about who who we are as people and and we and and who they are now is different than who we were oh. in the in in, t- in the 90s and 2000s the, right the biggest indicator of the change in my opinion is the rise of champion as a streetwear brand because <clears throat> when we were in kids champion was the losers cheapo you know basketball shirts and you know cheap whatever but now champion is this like primo brand that like you're paying 80 dollars for like a, a what is that a, a fanny pack yeah or whatever it be <laughs> it's it's crazy but uh yeah we're just getting some eyes of people oh, being like right. what the fuck are we doing yeah. but uh that's cool it happens it what's what's up it's not the weirdest thing that's going on at this tim Warren's for sure you no know that. no <laughs> and that, that's the problem is too like like i don't want to like downplay you know what happens on these streets but i also don't want to like amplify it either like it's, it's it's that hard balance of like like you call it slum unity slum unity slum unity like it uh, well, now it's that you deviation know. of cam unity yeah. right and rap loops and stuff like it's it's like it's a, it's an acceptance of like where we are but y- you know what i mean you have to draw that fine line of like being positive but being like realist well now that you know the the story behind Slum Glutton, that's not where it really where it's from, right? Yeah. It's about what it is is a mix of culture. A oh. mix of everything. Slum Gullion totally. was a, was like I said, it was a mixture of all the table scraps and all the all the kids that you didn't pay attention to in school. All the all the ideas you threw away, all the things that you you you, you don't really you know that people that the main mainstream were like not mainstream but just like society throws in the gutter and I scrape all that shit up and put some cheese and some shit on that <laughs> shit and I fired up and that's slum glutton man and so like when I say slum unity and I say yeah, slum man, loops it. It, ain't, it ain't talking about the gutterness it's just talking about the it's talking about all the shit that you that you threw away that, that no other people don't want that I'm gonna mix up I'm gonna make something good out of it I that's how I <laughs> used the word trash right like like I found this piece of artwork at the side of the road and like someone got really, really high and made this amazing piece of, of, of art on this piece of plywood and many people would have driven by, but it's like, no, I got to have that. It's sitting in the back of my car now and it's like, it's dope, but it's, it's but to someone else it's trash, mm-hmm. right? You know, I, I, I like looking at the dumpsters because yeah. they tell a story, right? Nice, man. You know, the, the artwork on dumpsters, shout out to, uh, to all the hardworking people who are currently painting the dumpsters as part of the city yeah. uh, project, but they're also painting over really what is a community message board <laughs> in a way. And, and, you know, they, they tell a, a, you know, a bleak story, but you know, yeah. those, those are still stories that kind of need to be told in one way or another. If they weren't paint, if they weren't covering up with paint though, then, then like, you know, then like, then it would be the normal and it wouldn't be as cool. Totally. So it's going to get covered up by some other cats going to come by and be like, you know what? What up? Slum glutton or whatever. Right? Yeah. It's all, it's, 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 it's street culture is, is, is ever evolving. As soon as you think you're caught up to it, yeah. it's five paces ahead. Yeah, well, you know, like I said, if it wasn't, like, if they just let us do it, it wouldn't be cool anymore. Totally. Right? Yeah. 
you know, yeah, like, we're, we're not, we're not going like to dry graffiti. snitch on yourself though, but you no, know. no, 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 you know what I mean, right? Yeah, like graffiti, totally. like you're talking about graffiti, right? Is that what you're talking oh, about? Oh yeah. Graffiti yeah. arts, you know, yeah. just, I, I love reading. I love reading the dumpsters. I, I, I just love it. What? Just the graffiti on it? The graffiti on oh, it. Right. Just oh, because, because yeah. they're the community message board, oh, yeah. right? It's people who don't have phones and they need to communicate. Oh dude. I never even noticed that. Oh, re- oh. I just thought you were talking about graffiti. Gra- oh, graffiti! Like, well, they, but, but oh, they do dumpsters. like call me, meet me here, yeah. Yo, straight you know up. Trip, what's a trip? Back, you say that, and I never even thought about it. I went to a picnic table, and it was. I could tell it was like, it, it was so like me, like, it was like, oh hey babe, sorry, this is the last way I could reach you. Um, I'm going to treatment tomorrow in in uh, in Abbotsford. Um, um, you know, this is my email, and like, and then like she like answered back, even though she knew they got. It was crazy, and it was like this whole picnic table, and I was like, oh shit. Yeah, they're, they're, I never they're, even they're totally a community message board. And, yeah. like, it's bleak and it's sad, but it's like I, I get I get some sort of insight into yeah. what these people are going through. And You know, something like, you know, what's cool is, like, I don't agree with it 100%, but, or the, like, um, if you ever, if ever, anyone ever listens to punk rock, like, no effects, which is I kind of want to kind of rip this style off because they do a, they do a musical called Home. Uh, yeah, so what is it? No, it's called uh, Home Street Home, and they do a musical. You can go and see it in San Francisco. It's a punk rock musical where the char- the main characters are these homeless kids, but they love it. They got nowhere to go, and they're living free, and they live on the streets, and like they catch a lot of flack because they make it sound really positive. Yeah. And then like some of it, like the drugs and stuff, they make it really positive because they're like super against like recovery and stuff. But those are those are people who haven't lost the power of choice. But and there's a lot of people out here. But what I think of what is free about it is like yeah, like you know what we're like all oh, these poor guys, but you see a group of people who have each other's back that live on the streets. Oh yeah. And 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 this is the way that they live. Like there's a lot of beauty in that. You might not want to be there and but if you ever do get you're going to have camaraderie there. You're going to have people taking care of you. You're going to have people you're going to have stuff that is is life. That's love and and and, and there, there there's certain spots that you just go see and like sometimes I pass them just like yeah, like their their situation is not amazing right now, but man, they're always surrounded by their homies. Yeah. At at the very least they have that. And like we have, and they have people fake homies too. Just like we have fake, fake homies and fake coworkers and of bosses course. that rip us off. Like it's this it, life don't change, man. Not, like, the circumstances do, right? Like yeah. you know. And it's just like yeah, like it's. I don't know. I, I wish, I wish more people in Camels were just a little bit more in tune to the streets. And and and, and obviously I'm 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 I, yeah. I'm of privilege, right? I'm not going to d- downplay my privilege. Yeah. And like, like I, I, I think. I mean, I don't know if I'd say I'm from privilege, but, like, I definitely never went without, right, like we were talking about earlier. But, yeah, no, but I can also also relate because I remember, you know, just eating rice and and having soup and crackers and just being like, this is all I get because it's all we got. But could you imagine taking that one step forward and not having anything? No, I couldn't. I I can't relate to that. Yeah. I I, I struggle seeing, like, the, the keyboard warriors on these Facebook forums and cam loops, you know chirping all these people and it's like guys come on like well, have a little bit of empathy but you know but people will always judge and that's yeah. that's the beauty of, of hip-hop I, ju- I just did that the dumpster diving track and no and you know and it was funny because i had a dumpster diving track just is a uh, it's a throwaway track that he took seriously that makes fun of a character in our sphere who is notorious for scamming, but we love him, but hate him at the same time. It, I, it, it, it's a long story. It's a long story, but the funny thing was is that I wrote it seriously. Um, it got to the point. I didn't want to throw a bunch of like uh, production behind it. I got challenged to do this guy's beats, but um, if it, the song is about from, from when I was homeless. I wrote, I wrote a song about being homeless, and at the end, I, I, I poked fun at, at the guy about his – but what I, I never said – F hell, I never said fuck corn pet. I never said none of that. I played a skit. I made a skit about an actual event where where he was trying to scam people, and he got caught on Facebook Live trying to scam people. So, but the actual song, and and I threw a couple references to it during the verses, so people might think it's a diss to him, but it's 
not. I, I talk about at the beginning of the song. It's a serious song about homelessness because I've been homeless before. You know, I didn't have to eat out of dumpsters, but I had no home. I had nowhere to go. I li- I slept in a forest. You know, I oh, had really? to go steal. Yeah, man. It would. You know, I I I had a lot of close people in my life, and I didn't want to go there. But I, I never really had to be there. But I spent time on the streets, sl- sleep. You know, and it, and it was rough. So, you know, and it's like, and people are like, aha, uh-huh. I was hoping that some real ones would catch the fact that the song was real and the skit was, was kind of just a, just kind of a joke on the guy uh, who we all make fun of. But yeah, I think. Well, well, how did you get off the streets, if you don't mind me asking? What was like the, the turning point? How'd you get off the streets? No, like I said, I, um, okay, so I went, um, I worked at a job for like eight years i i took it was so hard in school like it took me three years to pass grade nine and i oh, really? and i and i had to like cheat to, that last time i had to like cheat to get it and i was like god damn i'm like in um uh, and the addiction was taken over i was 16 17 and um yeah i just ended up going to work at this warehouse uh, west fair foods man shout out to west fair foods i think anyone in the maple Ridge, pit meadows area you probably worked there once and quit i worked graveyards there i ended up working there for seven years just short of seven years and um my addiction got to me i um i i had to quit i, I they put me um they told me i had to like stay sober and clean because i was like i know uh, it's a union job Sorry for mumbling here, but it was a union job, and I lost so many strikes. They were going to fire me. It's hard to get fired from a union job. They, they were trying to work with you is what yeah. you're saying, though. Well, and then I ended up calling there, like, you can't fire me because I got a drug problem. And they're like, oh, yeah. They're like, well, you're off work until you get help. And I was like, well, you guys aren't going to fucking help me. And they're like, no, you got to get help on your own. We just can't fire you without giving you the opportunity. Like, the, <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> so I, like, they, they got me back in, and then they're like, okay, well, by the way, now that you're back – you would do random drug tests. And I was like, what? So I got pinched, and, and they're like, hey, now you got to go to treatment. Because first I just did, like, counseling and did a couple of dances, and I got back on. And I was like, can you smoke weed in treatment? They're like, no. I'm like, hey, I'm not going. Peace, quit. Sign on the dotted line. <laughs> and I was like, I lived with my dad at the time, and he struggles with, uh, he was struggling with lots of surgeries. So he's like, if you take care of me, I'll take care of you. So I wasn't working. Um... I was struggling with my addiction, um, and I ended up going to move to Vernon with a friend, getting into lots of trouble, man. And like, I was, I went crazy, man. I almost like I did a bunch of crazy shit. I tried to get put in a psych ward, like, and it was just like my life was fucked. And I, I had nowhere to go. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna come back home. And um, yeah, I got in a fight with my dad, and um, and uh, I had nowhere to go. And uh, I would live in a very close knit community, Hammond. Tons of people would have helped me, but I went. I said, you know, out of pride, I said, I'm going to go live in the magical forest. If it, shout, out, shout out to anyone Ridge knows what the magical forest is, you know. And I had my suitcase, and I was sleeping there, and I was basically wasn't sleeping because I was always high. And I remember one day I was pissing rain. I was walking out with my suitcase, and someone from the neighborhood see me, and they're like, "Get the fuck in the car." You know, you sleep on my couch. And I was like, I was couch surfing from couch to couch to couch to couch. And some people were like, if you're going to get high, you can't sleep here. So there was nights where I was like, fuck, I'm going to get high. I'll go stay on the streets, right? So my my um, homelessness was very was very short. Probably about a year where I did not have a home. Um, short, yeah. that's a long fucking time. Uh, I mean, maybe maybe half a, half a dozen nights where I had nowhere to go, where I, where I had nowhere to sleep, where I slept in the, in the, in the bushes and shit. But, um, so I don't want to sit here and turn up front like I was homeless like some of these people, but I know what it's like to not have a home, yeah. to have to ask for a place to sleep, to ask for a shower. You, you were the hidden homeless is what they're called, right? Yeah. The, the ones who, who, who couch surf or whatever. Yeah. But, uh, you know, let's, let's make it a little bit positive. Let's, let's, let's wrap it up on a positive note. What's something we haven't <laughs> talked about? You know, we're, we're coming up to an hour now oh, okay. there, Riley. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we've actually used your real yeah, name um, yet. My name's Riley. My name's Riley. Yeah. Riley, a.k.a. Slum Glutton. Yeah. That's some pretty real shit, man. Yeah, man. It was... Uh, What's something positive in your life? Something positive? <sighs> my, the community. The community of people that... that um, or in recovery, you know, and I, I, like I said, I'm not going to get into details, but, you know, there's people out there um, that are just there to help people, man. And if you have problems, and if you're listening right now and you have problems with alcoholism or addiction, there's people that will go so far to help you. Um, it, it's crazy, man. And that, that's something good in my life um, right now is that I get to, I get to, 
I get to I get to help people and people get to help me and that's and that's what life's all about, you know. And um, if I was out there, taking 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 like I was, I would never get the opportunity to help someone, you know. Yeah. And 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 that's great. I have people in my life that love me, and I have people in life that I love. You know, and I'm not there because I want something, and they're not here because they want something. Um, I have a wonderful job, which I would have never had um, if um, if I was out there using. You know, and it's it's crazy. Um, How'd you end up in Kamloops? I went to treatment in um, in Abbotsford, King Haven. Shout out to King Haven, great place. Um, I had the opportunity. They're like, you need to go uh, to you need to go to to um, you need to go into second stage housing or you're going to relapse and you're going to die. That was what they said. And then I was, and they're like, so I was like going to go to second stage housing in Abbotsford where there's like more people using in these second stage houses than anything. Or I was going to go back home to my neighborhood where I knew I could find somewhere to stay. Or I was going to move up to Candles because I have some family here that are clean and sober. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to start a new life. Start over. Start over. I moved up here. I was like, like, like when you start, it's funny, like whatever your beliefs are, but I know you start doing the next right thing. You start doing good things in your life as opposed to doing bad things. Good things start happening to you. So I came up here with the good intentions of just starting a new life and, and becoming a person where I could be helpful and, be, and help other people and, 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 and allow people to help me, like get rid of that ego. And all these things started happening to me. I got this job. I got all these amazing friends, you know, like... Every, all my friends back home, like I came from a really close community, so I, it's like family, and they're they're awesome, and they're always there. But you know, those people don't understand addiction and alcoholism from from my perspective. So yeah. here, my, I'm, I'm, uh, the recovery community is like the best gift that I've ever had, and and you know, and like and my spirituality, you know, I'm trying just trying to be a better person, man. Every day. Every 1% day. And, better. And I fall down. All, and I do bad shit. And I'm, you know, and I, and I make mistakes. And I hurt people. But the thing is, is that I just, I just try to make it right. Yeah. You know. It's, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough, man. Yeah, I feel is. that. Yeah, man. You know. Even just being one week, no THC was just oh, like. Oh, buddy. That's fucking. the worst. Yeah. That's the worst thing ever. I hate, I hate quitting week because it was, it was my DOC. Like I was, I was messed up on cocaine and pills, and uh, and uh, whenever I drank, I turned into an animal, and bad things would happen. But every time I've gotten sober, the weed was the hardest thing to kick, man. And now I don't have to wake up in the morning. It's it's been a month since I quit smoking weed, no THC, and it was brutal this time because it was like I went two years no weed, and then I was smoking every day, and it was like motherfucker, man. I I had to wean myself off, like, and and it just I used uh, THC oil and grape soda, <laughs> all right, and all I, right. I used less and less THC <laughs> until the bottle was dry, and I was just <laughs> drinking grape soda. Okay, and yeah. it's like oh sweet. I can I can function yeah. through the day, it's, you know. It was weird, man. It's, it's hard to explain. Like one o'clock hits and you have to smoke a joint, or you're just gonna shut down. Oh. But, you know, the craziest thing was I got I, I, I got laid off, and I was like I said I wasn't I wasn't my life wasn't focused on recovery, and I got laid off, and then I was like, yo, pass me that joint, and I took one hit and I was off to the races. But I was so the whole time I and then like I got drunk a couple times and like I got out of the blow a couple times, and then I was like, okay, this is going right back to where my life was. But the whole time I was smoking weed around the clock, but I was off work, so I was like, it was like weird looking. It was like coming into recovery for the first time it was like looking at life in a brand new pair of glasses it was like looking through a life through a new pair of glasses like i never i was i was i was on something some sort of a substance every day since i was every day for sure since i was 14 probably 13 and for the first time in my life i was like looking at life sober and then this time when i started smoking weed just in july it was like it was like looking through in that old pair of glasses, man. It was a trip, and like, and I was like, holy! And I just remember like, it was just weird. Yeah. And it was, and then again, coming off of it again, and going back to seeing. I, said, oh, it's, it's I, I went. I had like a small vacation where where the family and I went to Revelstoke and just went camping. And I couldn't smoke weed because I was with my wife and kid, and there was just no way. And then like as soon as I came back, I was like, eh, I'll just have a joint. <laughs> Like 
okay, that was a four joint day. Oh, yeah. Then the next day, three yeah. joint day. It was just like, okay, it it, it 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 clicks. It's just like it snaps in, and it's just like. When I left, uh, when I left King Haven, I was five months clean and sober, no weed, and. At that point, I had reservations. I was like, one day I'll smoke weed again. Weed is not that bad, which maybe, like I said, maybe it is for some people. For me, it's terrible. And I was like, when I when I get a year, I'll, I'll try weed again. And then I took, I was five months, and I was like, okay, well, when I get six months, maybe I'll try. Two days later, I started smoking. And I remember, I, I was like, okay, I wasn't working at the time. It was before I got this job. And I was like, man, if I like... If I if I go to the gym and I go job hunting and I come home and I smoke one joint, it, it'll be okay. I, I'll, I'll the keep justifications. Going, yeah, I'll keep going to my recovery meetings. I'll, everything will be fine. It'll be fine. Day one, did all my shit. Went to a meeting. Went to all, did all my stuff and went job hunting. Came home or went to the gym. Came home, puffed one, ate some food, went to bed. I'm like, okay, day one, mint. Day two, same thing, perfect. I'm like, yeah, I say nothing. Day three, I woke up at four in the morning. Crawled out to the freaking where I kept my weed, rolled the joint, smoked it, went back to bed, and it was a ten joint day for fucking three weeks. Oh yeah. Didn't go to the gym. Didn't go to meetings. Didn't talk to anybody who was sober. Didn't. And I wasn't being. I wasn't being a helpful person. I was being. A, I was hanging out in my room, hiding, being a piece. Of, like not. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. I was. I was isolating from the world, not not doing anything good for anybody. Yeah. It. I struggle with. It. Like I. I, I want. Like I'm on a. A different reason of, of taking a break, whatever it be, yeah. but like just now I have these ADHD pills that are pretty dope, and when I remember to take them, yeah. life's good. See, that's another thing. I suffer from ADHD, but they only prescribe stimulants and amphetamines. I was I was wired on cocaine and, and meth, so when they I go and get a prescription for uh, ADHD, they give me dexedrine or, um, or methylphenidate, which that's that's basically pharmaceutical blow and pharmaceutical speed. Yeah, I think I'm on ri- like Ritalin. I think it's a methamphetamine. Methylphenidate is Ritalin, yeah. and it's called Concerta. You're probably on Concerta. Uh, it's, it's called Focus Right. Okay. It's, this one is like it's like it's it's, it's slow acting. Slow release. It's a stimulant. Yeah. It's like it's like I used to be on dextrin, which is an amphetamine, so that would be closer to to the speed, right? Yeah. And then and then stim- I made sure my doctor wasn't giving me the one with the amphetamines in it. Oh, I, I was sure. very I was yeah. very clear. I was like, I don't want this shit they because would, I know for a fact I'm gonna start yeah. pill popping it. They wouldn't give me that stuff because, like I said, um, when I sm- uh, when I first left King Haven, I was five months and I smoked weed. Before I smoked that joint, actually, I was um, um, I was uh. I was looking for funding for the government to start a career, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I went, and I stood, and if, if for anyone that's not in Kamloops, here in Kamloops, you have to wake up at 7 in the morning to go to the clinic, stand in line all morning, get a, get a, get an appointment, and then come back later. I stood there all day, and I went, and I'm like, I want ADHD medication. And he's like, and he's like, I'm like, I want Dexedrine. They're like, no, you're an addict. We can't give you that. I'm like, okay, well, then I want Ritalin. They're like, okay, well, we'll give you Concerta, which is the same thing. And then he's like, what size pill do you want? I'm like, 72 milligram, which is the biggest one they make. And the guy was like, okay. So I went and took this pill, and, like, first thing I thought in my mind was like, oh, shit, I'm high as fuck. <laughs> and, it, and I got sick. And it was crazy because I was in driving school at the time. And I was, like, driving around all bombed out on, on fucking Ritalin. And I hadn't been on anything in, in five months. And it was a trip, man. Oh, man. I forget what, uh, what, what they gave me the first time around. I just, like, it was an antidepressant. I just knew it wasn't right for me. Because yeah. it was just, like, when you take it and all of a sudden the world's ten times brighter, yeah. something's fucked up. But, Slum, where can people find you if they want to listen to your music? Are you on Spotify yet? No, you can catch me on uh, YouTube right now, um, uh, Slum Glutton. Um, I'm just starting that up. If you want to hear all my old stuff, you got to go to the ever so popular Reverb Nation. Got all my music on there. Number one, number I'm, one. I'm number one. Just, just throw that flex out there. I'm number one in my area. You know, and you can you can hate on me if you want to, but you know what? I got a lot of dope tracks on there. But um, I'm trying to bump up uh, my YouTube one. So uh, Slum Glutton. If you just Google it, all my music will come up um, from from whatever platforms I'm on. You're lucky you have a good name that's just like unique enough yeah, that, that yeah. people can actually find no you. No one's name is Slum Glutton. Uh, just 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 the other day, I seen someone's name Slum G. Some like, and they're like some like uh, I don't know. They're like 
from Africa or something. And they're like, uh, the name was Slum G, and I'm like, oh shit. I was like, but you, there's no one else in the world named Slum Glutton. So, <laughs> well, thanks, thanks for being so open and honest, and like, yeah, man. you know, talking about shit that most people they aren't comfortable, you know, talking about or listening to, or maybe or, someone out there's listening. And they're going through a hard time, and they need to hear that, right? Yeah, man. Reach out to AA or NA. There is a lot more people in this town that uh, are part of those groups that, yeah, they stay anonymous and they stay in the shadows and stay quiet, but they're, they're doing big things and they're big names, right? Y- you never really know who's, uh, who's an addict. And, you know, I, I wear, that, uh, I wear that, that label proudly myself because, yeah. you know, I think that's my way of trying to break uh, the stigma. Well, geez, if I, ever, if I never found out that I was an alcoholic and an addict, I would have sort of thought I was crazy. <laughs> well, I am crazy. I, you know, I'm not going to d- deny that. If, uh, if you're new here... You know, throw me a like, subscribe, whatever be, you know, find me on Spotify, iTunes, whatever it is. You know, if you want to hang out with, with Slum Glutton and I online, we're always online on the BC Underground Hip Hop Forum or the Canadian Underground Hip Hop Forum. It's, uh, it's a good community. You know, we, we have our own jokes, jabs, and, and, and culture there. Download a meme generator and you're in. Yeah, it's the, it's a great place to, uh, you know, get some negative energy out in, in a weirdly positive way. It's, it's pulled me through some really, really dark times. I, I, it's pulled through a lot of people through some dark times, and, and we've, we've cultivated a very, very unique community there. Um, and, yeah, if, if you're interested in hip-hop at all, you know, check it out. And uh, other than that, you'll be sure to find myself or Slum at uh, whatever hip-hop show is happening here in Kamloops because, you know, it's a small community. It's growing. This town was a hip-hop mecca, you know, not too long ago, and it's coming back. It's coming back. Rap Loops is is, is bringing it back, and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to Snack the Ripper, Lil Windex, Gray Baker, Leno TK, Kairos. Kairos. At, uh, at CJ's Friday, the, the 27th of September. So be sure to check out that and show. October 5th at the Rockin' Frickin', you're going to catch the Hazmat Crew. Yes. And Slum Glutton and a bunch of other dope MCs. The, the Hazmat Crew bring a whole different level of energy. Oh, my. The, they are entertainers. They're not just rappers. They no. have this whole choreographed. Oh, like show the, the energy level they bring is, is I actually is I tough. had to go out today and I caught myself a costume because I, I can't I can't open up for those cats wear normal clothes so I went out all out because I'm like these guys go all in their performance so I went and caught me a goddamn costume for this one yeah and, and for the price of the ticket like I guarantee you you won't get like a no. more intimate insane no. high energy show and, and these guys are legends in the the underground hip hop community bitter rhythms coming up to natty snaps that guy will fucking make you laugh like i i, I huge huge props to those guys and natty snaps is like you might if you're if you're a little like offend if you're offended easily don't don't come but uh, yeah <laughs> Nat, natty snaps he he makes sure uh, you know free expression is uh, tested in this country <laughs> yeah but uh in a good way oh, yeah. he, he he means well and uh you know, he supports the homies, and he's a good bloke, even though he does like to, you know, push the line. Yeah. But uh, Well, I've seen that. I mean, this will end on this, I guess. So the last hip-hop show I went to, uh, the TBK, the blind kid, uh, gave him a lap dance. That was the weirdest thing. <laughs> yeah, have you ever this, been this, to this, a hip-hop show where a man gave another, a blind man gave another man a lap dance? And he, he throws his, like, his seeing eye stick, <laughs> I don't know what it's called, into the, the audience, and then basically gets naked down to his boxers <laughs> and gives another man a lap dance and then like he didn't know he was giving him a lap dance so natty because he's blind right so natty pulled a chair up close to him and was like oh it was mint man some people didn't like it but it was fucking hilarious that's what hip-hop's about it's about pushing boundaries and testing and and, and really exploring who you yeah. are oh, for yeah. all others to see laugh and <laughs> you know have a good time but uh, i appreciate everyone for for tuning on in uh you know this is my third episode this month i was hoping to get four out so i still have a couple days to make that happen and uh yeah i appreciate you and uh for more interesting conversations at you know weird places in town be sure to subscribe to cameo with never webster peace